Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Metaphysical Egypt. I'm Alan Peoples, again with Patricia Owey on Lehman. And this is our second part of the series on the ancient magnetic equator and the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, let's get started. <laughs> and so we're going to start out today again with the cherubim um, <laughs> as the magnetic field, um, the ch cherubim of the Ark of the Covenant, if you will. Uh, mm. Earth's magnetosphere protects us from the solar wind and prevents the rays of the galactic of galactic radiation or enlightenment from us. Maybe until we have reached a level of consciousness that enables us to withstand them. This is one of the things we talked about last time. Um, and um, I bring it up again just to mention because we've talked about this great moment of silence and how does that happen as the earth is spinning. And it happens, of course, um, you know, we've, and again, we've talked about the wings coming down. It happens um, uh, if the magnetic field actually fails us. And, um, you know, I want to point out that right now, and, and something we, we have discussed before, but I want to point out again now, it, you know, that our magnetic field is weakening. And um, just recently, within the last 10 years, it's weakening exponentially. Um, and here is a quote from uh, Dr. Nicholas, Toveni from, uh, I'm not even going to try, it's <laughs> but he stated that um, the uh, geomagnetic field has been losing 30% of its intensity in the last 3,000 years. 30% is huge. Um, and this form of radiation can cause respiratory and cardiac issues and more. Uh, and, you know, this is, I bring it up because this is something we're starting to feel now. Uh, or experience now and you know I'm not going to get into what you know the events of the last three years but there could be a direct relationship by what's happening on the planet now and by this increase that we're seeing in lung and um, heart issues worldwide um, so you know I have heard differing reports suggesting that the earth's magnetic field has lost between 10 to 20 percent in the last 160 years um, but it definitely is occurring at a faster pace now. Jonathan O'Callaghan says, um, as the Earth magnetic shield fa fails, so do its satellites. First, our communication satellites in the highest orbits go down. Next, astronauts in low Earth orbit can no longer phone home. And finally, cosmic rays start to bombard every human on Earth. Um, and, and again, I, I think this is something we, we are experiencing now. Um, I'm a huge fan of Ben Davidson, um, and he speaks so much to this and, you know, the, the, the magnetic excursion that's happening now. And this plays a big part in what Alan and I are going to begin discussing. Um, and it, ha it plays a big part in what happens with um, the magnetics of the Earth itself and the grids. And, um, of course, we're going to introduce how it affects the magnetic equator itself, how precession affects uh, the magnetics of the earth. So right now I'd say, how do we prepare? You know, maybe it's a time to find our inner harmonic balance and be, and learn to walk in peace amidst the chaos because our attitudes and, um, you know, the, the way we interact with our reality, you know, it has a huge part to play in creating that reality. Um, and I do think we, if, if we, you know, stop reacting to every little thing and learn to transmute our fear that we can change how we walk through this in huge ways. You know, remember that we're not our bodies. You know, we are light beings and um, there's no reason why we can't walk through, you know, coming earth changes with grace and, um, um, hey, with our perceptions intact. <laughs> Who knows? Um, this is actually an image I did get from um, Ben Davidson's. Uh, he does a um, almost daily podcast uh, called Suspicious Observers on YouTube. And uh, as I said, his information is just incredible. But this is just an image showing how, how quickly the Earth's magnetic field is weakening. Um, look what's happened just since 1950. I mean, and it just makes this huge dip right now. So, you know, we're in the red zone, if you look at this. Um, and, you know, I don't do this to instill fear. I do this to open eyes. This is our moment of great awakening. These are huge. I think we lined up to be here now. 
um, and uh, how we experience what's about to occur. I mean, it, you know, it could be absolutely, you know, fantastic depending on how you perceive reality itself, if that makes any sense. <laughs> um, and of course, we will speak more to that, but I want to bring these ideas in because it is happening now. So what I, why I'm, we're, we're, we're so interested in this dynamic um, is because it is something that it's affecting us now and we want to get to the point where we do talk about how we deal with it and um, you know what are the possibilities of what happens next and how fast um, and it could be faster than you think um, so here is some great imagery um, you know and and again we talked about how you know just if you're in the, in in tune with the universe you can create um, <clears throat> with this knowing um, it just flows through us. And of course, there is a, um, a lineage of passing down this, this ancient knowing uh, through mystery schools. So when it pops up, um, you know, I take notice. Um, and I, I just love this one on the right. You can even see the Holy Grail at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And it's in, you know, it's in that alignment um, between, the, you know, it, within this portal. And you could see that the, the two Caduceus is going in two opposite directions of this 23.5 degree angles. And we see the same thing in the image on the left, um, you know, that the, that the, uh, the erect pillar, you have someone standing basically not in motion, right? That's the stillness in the center. And these two gentlemen you know facing different directions on either side at these 23.5 degree angles you know um dual opposing viewpoints basically um and this is ba the earth actually does this tilting as it precesses um you know as we precess through the uh through the great year the um Procession, the procession of the equinoxes. Mm. Exactly. So we do see these these dual, dual tilts as this happens. Um, and again, you see the erect jet pillar in the center. It's that, you know, annual. This And when I say annual, they celebrated it annually. They celebrated it in hip sets. But, you know, it, it, annually on a great year basis is basically um it's biannually in a way, it's every 12,000 years. Mm -hmm. It's the intake and the outtake of breath that we have a pause. One um, half of the processional cycle, which is 26,000 years. Yes, exactly, give or take. Give or take. Uh, so yeah, because I've heard different understandings of you know how that actually works um, in our, our, our perception of time itself. Um, and so that Holy Grail, you know, finding it requires that we come back to our center. That's the thing. The Holy Grail is the heart of consciousness. You know, it's what we're all seeking, right? <laughs> so I love this image. And uh, I decided to, to take it apart for everyone to actually see what we're looking at. Because that image of the ochre is part of my logo, Horus Rising, right? Um, and... Uh, you know, one of the reasons I chose it is because it holds this incredible depth of knowledge with, you know, within a simple symbol. Um, and I just find it amazingly attractive. <laughs> but here we're looking at, you know, basically this, this is, I call it zero point during Un before Zeptepi, right? It's that moment of, of silence before the first time, right? And so, you know, uh, if you look to the far left, you see this wonderful image of Hattor um, as the, it, it's almost like she's mummified. She's, you know, she's cloaked, right? In a, in a garment of, of, you could even say stars, primordial waters, right? She's on a, a, a symbol that represents the primordial waters, the primordial womb of unlimited potentials. You know, at Un, the moment of silence. Right? It looks like a black box with the head of Sokar. Doesn't it? It is. <laughs> Sokar being Osiris at that moment of silence, right? So it, it's, it's really showing you this. And you see the eye, it's primordial consciousness. Now, right? is this image of Hathor related to the image we see in Dendera of Sokdet yes. in the bark that... Osiris as Orion is waving goodbye to 
as he begins the hero's journey? Well, it is related in some ways. This is this is so that that image is definitely serious, and I and, and that image to me represents um, our matriarchal spin. And then you see the image of Horus on the uh, erect papyrus pillar, and then right after that, Osiris taking the first step in the other direction into the patriarchal. Um, and in this case, the cosmic cow is the Milky Way uh, as Hathor. Um, which is the primordial waters from which we, you know, symbolically the primordial waters from which we are born. Um, and here, as I said, you can see the eye above, right above her back, and that's showing you this is primordial consciousness, right? Mm. You know, this is where we imagine the world into being from this primordial womb. Um, and so in the center of the, of the, um, of the Acker, we, we see this <laughs> the the Akhet with the sun rising right on, on the backs of the two lions facing either directions, and this is Dwaj and Sefer. This is yesterday and tomorrow, right? It's Shu and Tefnut, um, just different ways of expressing the same. These these lions, um, it's the twins of Gemini, right? And they're back to back. And on their back, it carries the the acre or the acre of the sun, the horizon, the sun rising at that first time. And in between is the key of life, right? So it's it's basically showing the key of life is almost like the the uh, mooring post because this is where everything's going to begin to spin, mm -hmm. right? Into the life force that is that peppy. It's that first breath, that first time. Um, and it's a be beautiful showing of this, you know, and it happens in between that moment of silence, in between yesterday and tomorrow, any perception of past and future. Um, and there is no past and future. There's only now. Um, and then this expression, this perception of a linear 3D reality. Um, powerful, powerful uh, imagery. But this all occurs at Tepi on the Giza Plateau um, at, you know, and it's Haramakit. It's the alignment as the line of fertility. This is the ancient magnetic equator and it goes through the paws of the Sphinx um, and across the prime, the ancient prime meridian. Um, and we pointed out that the pyramids representing, the, you know, that, that, uh, that prime meridian, the, the, uh, the pyramidian, which meant fire in the middle, um, it, it's it's just a huge sequence uh, uh, symbol that we will discuss in in great detail as we. This go is forward. the path of the ancient magnetic equator. We see the four globes on the bottom, which is exactly. different than our geographic equator now. Exactly. So I'm going to get into all of that explanation. This is I'm introducing it now because this is the place. Um, uh, well, it's this is the time and the place is the Giza Plateau. Mm -hmm. So, OK, so this is from the ceiling of the Temple of Kanum at Esna. And the ceiling is just being cleaned. And this imagery is now, you know, available for us to see oh, in, in all its beauty. It's incredible. Um, and I took this picture. You can even see part of the column on the lower left hand corner um, covering Ptah. But you're seeing, you know, again, this moment of silence. There's Osiris on his back, right, on the bark. And underneath that, you see primordial consciousness. That, mm -hmm. That's that moment of silence and primordial consciousness. On the right, here is the lioness. It could be Tefnut. It has a serpent, right, on her head, right? The life force, the kava of Ra, the line of fertility, right? The lion of fertility, <laughs> uh, if you will. And on the uh, left side is Pata, you know, and he, he represents the projection into form from out of the blue primordial waters, right? So it's that same moment just um, symbolized or, or shown with different symbolism. And in, in the Akar, here, here is some other imagery. They, they actually at one time in, in more ancient times had... Um, the two lions were actually connected as like one one being with mm -hmm. two heads, uh, but it represents the Akra itself. It's a place of no time between heaven and earth. 
Hawker was first described as one of the Earth Netheru guarding the gate, the portal to the yonder site, right? The netherworld, the heavens. You know, Hawker was first depicted as the torso of a recumbent lion with a widely open mouth. Later, he was depicted as two recumbent lion torsos merged with each other. Um, and, and on the right, I, you can see Dwaj and Sefer uh, as that same image that we saw above. Um, from the ancient papyrus of Ani. Um, and from the Middle Kingdom onwards, Akra appears as a pair of twin lions. Again, you know, these are the twins of Gemini, um, and they're going to separate to create our perception of yin and yang polarity. Um, Akra was thus often titled, he who's looking forward and behind. When depicted as a pair of lions, a hieroglyphic sign for horizon, um, two merged mountains and a sun disk was put between the lions and the lions were sitting back to back. So um, just beautiful again imagery. Now here is here is a, a drawing of what you see on the... Um, uh, oh, the uh, Stella in front of the Sphinx, right? Exactly. Um, the one, uh, it's the Stella... Uh, the Stella dream Stella. Of, of, yes, Tutmos the Fourth, the dream Stella, exactly. Um, and so uh, it was also called Rastel for the mouth of passages. Um, but what you're seeing again is there is your winged disc above showing this is Un, Un, a moment of silence with two back to back lions on the symbol of Rastel, the first time, Seth Pepe, you know, at that moment that, um, you know, that divides in the place between the paws of the Sphinx. At the place of the ancient magnetic equator that divides the dual opposing wave spin of the two hemispheres of the planet, you know, at one time when we were in perfect balance, um, it, it existed on the path of the sun on the ecliptic. Um, so incredibly powerful, powerful line of fertility. Um, and um, I actually created the image on the left here. And it's showing you the center of the Taurus field, right? With the sun, the heart at the, at the center on the ochre <laughs> with mm -hmm. the two lions. Because facing away from each other, the lions or the lines form the electromagnetic container, the matrix of the mind, the maya, the illusion of a 3D reality. When they come back together, they create the portal to the sun, the center, the lion's heart. We've heard about the lion's heart, right? Mm -hmm. That's the heart at the center. That's the holy grail. You know, the, these are the lion's gates, if you will. Um, so it's the portal where transformation occurs. And you might have seen, as, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, so one, I was just going to say one more thing, as above, so below, right? The top reflects the bottom as dual opposing weights spin. Go ahead. Just... Going back to what we said before about this ancient knowledge being used today to sell things, what do we have? We have Lionsgate films. <laughs> yes. I mean, with with so little knowledge about where it comes from, what, how, and how powerful this imagery is, and what it represents, uh, you're absolutely right. Um, and people celebrate the Lionsgate, and you know. Uh, with, with uh, when Sirius, the helical rising of Sirius in August, all these things are important as cycles within cycles and metaphors for these these particular expressions of universal cycles. These are these are the forces of nature. This is what the Netaru are speaking to um, within this breath of life. Uh, on the on the um, right hand side, on the top, you see. Um, the sun god as a child within the Ouroboros. Again, never ending cycles. What's that? Ihi. It could, yeah, it could be Ihi from, well, Ihi, Horus is called Ihi at Dendera, the temple of Hathor. And it's funny because in the different temples, the name is different because it's marking a different expression because of the angle of the sun hitting the earth at that oh. particular latitude. Mm -hmm. Isn't that fascinating? Interesting. Yeah, that's knowing. That's ancient knowing. Expression, understanding. That you know, every gnome of Egypt was at a different latitude, and therefore had a different um, gnomon or face of Hathor to explain that particular frequency. A different um, tone. Mm. Exactly. Um, yeah, 
that that's that's incredible knowing. Um, and here we have an image that shows us uh, on, um, on the far left, and I have in the red circle, that's that symbol of um, the head of Osiris that we talked about a, a couple episodes ago. And it's sitting on the acre at the first time, right? So the moment of silence, the acre, you know, as, as you know, that sun, it, it, it's, it is the moment of sunrise, but it happens after, you know, that pause. And it's the symbol of the head of Osiris. This is incredibly powerful. And then it moves. So you see the serpent moving. That's Neheb Cow, right? Um, and it's showing how, you know, at first breath, everything begins to move. That's how we discern or perceive time and space through movement. Mm -hmm. And before that, everything is silent. It's just consciousness. Um, <laughs> that reminds me of the film Lucy that we like to reference yeah. so often, where she uh, she shows we the video of a car. <laughs> we have to do a podcast on that movie. You talked about it. You brought it up. And the more I think about it, the more I think it would be really fantastic. <laughs> um, there's so much embedded in that movie that, that speaks to everything we talk about. Um, so... From the words, the words of the god at tomb describe this dramatic moment. I will destroy everything that I have created. The earth will return to none, right? Nothing, no thing. To the water, as in the primordial age. I am the one who will remain with Osiris. I'll turn back into a snake, which is not known by men and is not seen by the gods. Um, <laughs> See, it, it, it is describing these energetic... I'll turn um, back into a snake. I'll turn back into a sine wave. Um, well, exactly. That's motion again. I am the one who will remain with the inert Osiris and then will turn back into a snake, which is not known by men and not seen by the gods, which is interesting. Hmm. So again, we showed this image a couple episodes ago, and it's the image of this symbol that was on the last slide of the head of Osiris on the bar, on the birthing box. Um, and is, I'm relating this and I'm bringing this in here now. It's called the Neshmet or resurrection bark of Osiris. But I also wonder, you know, are we looking at an original Ark of the Covenant? You know, are are we looking at an expression that's telling us that something, you know, possibly at Abydos, the Osirian, may have once been the place uh, or the seat of power that was the known as the Ark of the Covenant? You know, it's something that's never been discussed. They say the head of Osiris was buried at Abydos, but again, the head is that powerful um, conscious expression, the inert expression before the first breath. Um, so I just put it out there I, because I find it fascinating. Um, because this expression, this, you know, and I, it's just so much <laughs> um, that I have, I have a hard time sometimes expressing what I'm envisioning, but um, just things to think about consciousness itself. So this is great. In the spreading of the bone between the eyes is called the frontal sinus. It's the seed of the divine in man. There, in a peculiar gaseous material floats, or rather exists, or is, the fine essence which we know as the spirit. This is the lost city in the sacred desert, connected to the lower world by the rainbow bridge or silver cord, and it is to this point in himself that the student is striving to rise. This is the sacred pilgrimage of the soul in which the individual leaves the lower man in the world below and climbs upward into the higher man or higher world, the brain. Mm -hmm. This is the great pilgrimage to Shambhala. And as that great city is the center for the direction of our earth, so the corresponding great city in man is the center for his governmental system. Um, Fascinating, isn't it? Raising uh, kundalini energy up the spine. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> up the rainbow bridge. It's so interesting. Everything happening without is happening within. This is this is the key. As above, so below. So without, so within. Um, so where is this great arc, uh, um, arc of the covenant or ancient magnetic equator? Um, 
on, on, you know, that we're talking about on the Giza Plateau? Well, I've included this picture to give us an idea. Um, and it is where heaven met earth, except Tepe, you know, the, the first time. I believe that they're telling us that this first eternal breath starts with the Sphinx, one of the oldest statues on the planet, you know, that's still sitting there. In you the know, age of Leo. Place. Um, and yes, it's it's a lion, right? In alignment with this these these pyramids. But which these, age of Leo? Yeah, well, that's also the question at hand. Um, we've heard ten thousand five hundred BC, and we've heard maybe uh, two and a half great years, two and a half cycles. What did Hakim uh, say? He said two and a half. He said about, well, I've heard both that he said 36,000 and I've heard 52,000. Um, but again, you know, why do we have to know a time? Uh, we, we're so caught up with labels and putting things in containers and tying nice bows around it. I think it's more important to see her as an expression, um, as, as an understanding that can open our eyes to what's happening on the planet, especially today. Um, uh, and here, this is such a great picture because you can see she she's not, you know, you, you see the middle pyramid, which- You Hakeem, say she, meaning the Sphinx, meaning Tefnut. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, now, uh, Robert Schock has done a lot of great work um, with other um, researchers that, points out that it's possible she could be related to another ancient lioness, I think called Menhet. Um, I, I believe, you know, it's not the label for her expression that counts. I think over time, names change. We call mm -hmm. her the Sphinx. Hakim called her Tefnut, relating it to that story of Tefnut and Shu and, and the wandering um, goddess. Um, and, you know, Menhet has a similar, uh, I believe a similar background. I think the label just contains the knowing, um, and I don't think we need to be concerned with labels. So I do call her she, <laughs> as this, as she, she is in alignment with this, you know, this ancient line of fertility. I do know in my heart that she was a lioness at one time and and recarved, um, and we'll talk about her more as we move, you know, into the future. But uh, this picture does show that she's not in. You know, she's not in alignment with the causeway of the middle pyramid. She's sort of going at an angle. Um, and uh, I find that interesting as well. There's uh, the temple, an ancient temple in front of her, a birthing box, if you will. And then there's the belly temple, which um, Hakim also often related uh, to the same time period as the Assyrian, which uh, could be, you know, tens of thousands of years old. Um, but again, you know, to pinpoint timing is so difficult. Um, but uh, yeah, made with huge, huge blocks, similar to, uh, you know, megalithic blocks, similar to the um, Osirian behind the Seti One Temple at Abydos. So uh, yeah, this would be the path, the ancient magnetic equator that was aligned with so many sites around the world. Um, and it's, she is a feline, right? And feline, F-E, is the symbol for iron, mm -hmm. right? Iron line. And what I find fascinating, um, when I first moved here and uh, to live, I used to go up on the Giza Plateau um, just to, to hike and walk for hours. I mean, hey, I'm living in Egypt at the foot of the pyramids. I got it. I, I just had to spend as much time as I could up there. And as I did, you know, walking around the front of the middle pyramid, I saw all of this oozing like iron, iron oxide out of the ground. It was everywhere. Um, and it was hard. Um, and, you know, I found it, you know, it, it's even down along the causeway. It's, it's in this line with the Sphinx, right? Iron, by iron line. <clears throat> and um, I really found it fascinating. I even took a small chunk of it. I mean, it's everywhere. Um, and it's just like part of the ground. And I took a chunk of it and put it on my altar on uh, our balcony. And what was odd is it melted in the sun and uh, it became like this liquid, this reddish liquid. And um, I remember someone telling me that that's because you took it out of the place it was in for, you know, who knows, hundreds, thousands of years. 
And so it changed its consistency. You know, I don't know why. Um, I did, uh, I remember showing Robert Schock this, and I remember showing, um, I brought Susan Moore in, our geologist, and uh, she has since studied, she's found it inside the um, middle pyramid, which is fascinating. And she made her, you know, and I don't want to put words in her mouth, um, and it'd be great to do an interview with her. But I remember she speculated that it's possible that they were doing something, some sort of technology within the pyramid with which this was a residue. But it was the liquid that she says was seeping up out of the earth, um, which is, I, again, I find fascinating. And when Susan and I started visiting, running, you know, going, going to, and, and Alan, you were with us too, because um, you went to Anchor Wat before Susan got there. Um, but we were going to all these sites that were on this ancient magnetic equator as it's laid out geographically around the world. And Angkor Wat is one of those sites. And we found iron <laughs> in a similar dynamic, you know, and, you know, and, and some of the other sites that we visited that were on that line. And we, we were starting to see patterns that, you know, it's no surprise that it is related to sea lines. Um, and so, you know, just, you know, hinting at these things, again, we're going to go more in depth into this as we move along, but this gives you an idea of where it is. And here is that line, um, as, as it was mapped out by a friend of mine in Australia, Stella Wilden. And, uh, you know, it's, it's what I would call the ancient magnetic equator in Ma'at, you know, in, in perfect balance. Uh, I also call it the path of the whore, which I'll explain in a moment. Um, but it's, it was the time when Egypt was lush and green and, and beautiful, right? Um, now, and, if you put that flat map on a globe, this sine wave line is actually a straight line around the globe. Yes, but because we spin, um, you know, and, and geographic maps are never perfect. This is not what a, a true map of the land of the earth would look like. Mm -hmm. And that that becomes a problem. But, you know, this is mapped out the best we can, with, you know, with how, what she, it is a sine wave pattern, like the path of the sun that you see, you know, when you're you're flying, whenever you're flying in an airplane and they put the images up and, and talk about all the things that you need to know. Or, you know, you also see, uh, sorry, you also see the images of uh, where it's dark and light on the planet. It's always a sine wave pattern um, that you see you know, the images of dark and light because the earth is, is a sphere that is spinning. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that our perception right now is of a sphere uh, of a 3D image. Um, but uh, it, does, it does basically connect all these sites. And what's interesting is, you know, and, I, and I'm gonna introduce this um, in, in, in upcoming slides, but where you see it go through India and the symbolism there speaks about this ancient magnetic equator. Uh, and in, in a lot of these other places, Mahenjadero, uh, where there's so many anomalies um, and uh, all the Easter way- Island. Easter Island and Nazca and Petra and Siwa and uh, you know, all of these incredible places on earth where um, they do have things that seem to be harnessing this energy. And of course, Angkor Wat that we mentioned. So yeah, um, sexy woman, I believe as well. So this image in the lower left-hand corner is, I love this image. It's an image of Horus um, and he's a top, uh, like a, a, an image of a Sarek or something, but he's he has the dual crown of upper and lower Egypt. So. I, I relate that symbolism of the uniting of the two lands to this ancient magnetic equator where the two dual opposing wave spins meet. Mm. So that moment of silence when this line existed was the time that the, har the, the, the two hemispheres of the earth were harnessed in incomplete balance. Mm. And here you see Horus, the whore, riding the serpent, right? The cobra, the waveform. Um, and I, I sort of image that, you know, as this being this, this, this whore, if you will. Um, so horamakit means the alignment. And um, 
Zep Tepe, of course, the first breath. It's the line of fertility, as I said, on the Giza Plateau. And after Un, it moves. Um, and so you, you can see again the, these images of Horus, the golden Horus. Um, and these images are great. This is Garuda riding or mastering the current. And Garuda is like the Horus of India. And you can see here in the center, he's holding the Holy Grail, right? Mm -hmm. And he's got his foot on the serpent, <laughs> which you know I see as this, this ancient uh, magnetic equator. Um, he is known to be the vehicle for Vishnu, right? Here we see an image of Vishnu riding Garuda. And he takes uh, Vishnu into that great central sun, right? Just like Osiris is, uh, Horus is the ascended Osiris. Oh. Um, and uh, yeah, <laughs> incredible. So, and then the earth tilts and the power of God on earth, the whore starts moving. And there is my my logo. And you can see on the ochre, we have the image of Horus riding the current, right? Because that is the place of this wonderful ancient line of fertility uh, that I believe is the whore. This is the, the ascended Osiris when the earth was in balance at Un. Um, and so um, the Ark of the Covenant is the ochre at Septepi, in my opinion. And it it is always moving because this this heart of consciousness then begins to move. And so when we look at the path of the Ark of the Covenant, it's amazing um, <laughs> where it goes and where it begins and where it goes. Um, and so here I have this great image of the the Great Pyramid on it on the Giza Plateau, and um, I say it all starts here at Septepi, maybe. Um, the arc's dimensions are described in the Bible as 2.5 cubits by 1.5 cubits by 1.5 cubits, which is basically 45 inches by 27 inches by 27 inches. This is, just happens to be the exact volume of the stone resonance box in the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid. And so did the Ark of the Covenant start here on this ancient line, which was the ancient magnetic equator? that once harness the dual opposing spins of um, the, the two hemispheres of the earth. All starts here. And again, just to give you, um, I, I've shown you some in, imagery before. Here's some more imagery showing, you know, these images of Isis and Nephet. You see Knights, you see um, Selkit sometimes, but you see them on the boxes showing this, uh, the wings as magnetic field. Of, of these resonance boxes, um, ancient arcs, if you will. Mm -hmm. On this one on the right, you can even see the exploding um, cobras on top, you know, showing this moment of enlightenment, right? Mm -hmm. um, they're like little shrines, if you will. Um, and when it tilts, everything changes, right? And we have seasons, the four seasons, um, and a perception of time and space, the four directions. Um, so when one of the poles points more toward the sun than the other pole, that half of the planet gets more sunlight than the other half. And this is why we have the seasons, summer and winter, mm -hmm. um, experienced differently um, in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. And so when that moment occurs, you know, you, we wonder why there's stone circles all over the earth and we call them, you know, sometimes calendars and places for ritual. Um, we found out that there is resonance within them. Uh, sound technicians have experimented with, with uh, many of these stone circles. But I believe they, they, we created them originally to measure and document the movement of time and, time and objects in space. Um, they, they are aligned with all these different solar, stellar, and lunar movements, um, marking special moments, um, you know, in, in this new spin of the earth with the new um, reflections of, um, you know, the sun and the moon and the stars that didn't exist before. It's like a, a whole new way of measuring time and space. Um, and we know that many temples were built over ancient stone circles and temples themselves. Temples are, you know, it's, I've heard someone say that, you know, the word temple comes from the word tiempo, marking time and space. 
um, with their alignments as well. Um, and this is from Tarxian, uh, the South Temple um, from Malta. It, it's, it's, and it's in the museum right now uh, in Valletta, Malta. Uh, and I, I see this wonderful dual opposing waveform, right? And uh, this was done by Art M. Turler. And he speaks about um, these dual opposing wave spins as tracing the seasons, which I found fascinating. Well, he says the delicate S-shaped double spiral on curbstone, we have K13 at Noeth, and we've been here, Alan, mm -hmm. Noeth in Ireland. The um, central motif uses the same colors as in the figure six, whatever, to indicate the proposed seasons and is based on the exact shape of the engraved pattern as derived via three-dimensional capture and shown in the upper left corner. And here again, the suggested count of months corresponds to the orientation of the rising half moon visible on the east horizon and starts with the winter solstice. Um, and the lower right image shows that the same motif forms a part of the beautiful triple spiral in the central recesses of Newgrange. So what he's showing is that these are actually marking um, seasons and even um, uh, solstices and equinoxes. Uh, which again, is just timekeepers, who would have thought, you know, I thought it was just energy, right? That they were perceiving electromagnetic energy, but actually, you know, tracing uh, seasons and, and these powerful moments um, within a year, which can be a metaphor for, you know, or a, a, a fractal imprint of much larger cycles. Hmm. Um, yeah, pretty amazing. And then I found this fascinating too, because we talk about, you know, that we're imagining the world into existence from that primordial consciousness and um, this understanding that, you know, every sound has its own waveform within, you know, the Taurus field. So every word that we speak, every thought that we have, every tone is creation. You know, we said sound was creation, but to, to understand that at a huge level, that every tone has a different archetypal expression for creating something. Wow. That we need to be more observant of our tone mm -hmm. <laughs> and our use of words. You know, it's not just our attitude, but our, you know, our thoughts, our ideas, um, and how we express ourselves to people. You know, we're always creating that mirror that surrounds us, right? Um, every vibration in this universe has a color and sound. Every vibration also represents a particular idea, and hence each idea has a vibrational sound and vibrational color. Um, just fascinating. Um, and, and again, that's important, um, and, and because, it is all part of these natural laws that we talk about. And uh, again, I said I would address that uh, the things that were found in the Ark of the Covenant, and one of those things was supposedly these Ten Commandments, which many trace back to the, you know, the original understanding of the 42 laws of Ma'at, um, or meaning harmony or harmonic resonance. So what is this really telling us on a symbolic level? You know, is, is you know, are we really talking about things like, you know, th these laws, I have not committed sin, I have not committed robbery, or are they, is that just a retelling of something far more profound, which is laws, uh, you know, laws that define the new patterns and cycles of nature, right? So literally telling us, you know, that if we observe, if we stay, stick to the laws of nature and stay in balance and not, you know, and live and breathe in synchronicity with them or, you know, in harmony with these laws of nature, that we can maintain the balance of earth, you know, and our environment and our surroundings and in, in, in everything that we create. And if we don't, then we create our own chaos on earth. Um, and I, I honestly believe that this is what it means. Um, and, you know, the Ten Commandments, yes, you know, you know, if, if somebody's going to write down what all this means, they're going to list a bunch of things that they believe will keep law and order, uh, which is what they later come to understand Mott as. 
But um, her original, um, the intention of what she represents is basically the balance of nature, nature's cycles, nature's breath. Um, so yeah, after the petitioner's testimony containing the 42 affirmative declarations or negative declarations, the weighing of the copper truth and the reading of the scales, it is said that the doer of mat is administered mat. If the petitioner is deemed by mat to be in compliance with the 42 laws of mat, the petitioner passes from Dwat to the field of reeds, Iris, where Osiris sits in the as the final gatekeeper. They're describing the judgment scene here, mm -hmm. um, which is all tied into this, of course. Right. And the 40, you know, the 42 laws, there's 42 judges in that original judgment scene where they weigh the heart against the feather. Um, and so they're, they're looking at how you basically, you know, did you maintain harmony or did you cause um, isfet chaos? <laughs> The goal was to feel the currents in order to navigate and harness them. Um, and again, we've talked about implosive uh, technologies versus explosive technologies, uh, technologies that are in sync with nature as opposed to technologies that are um, destroying Mother Earth, you know, the synthetic foods that we eat destroying our bodies. Uh, the air that we breathe, the music we listen to, all of these things can either maintain mod or create chaos. This is where uh, biogeometry is coming in. Oh, in a big way. Feel the currents, harness the currents. Yep, yep. And learn how to, to utilize the laws of nature to make even the negative uh, currents more beneficial. You know, how to actually live in today's world which I, is so significant right now. Mm. Um, as I said, we, if we find how to walk in peace amidst the chaos, you know, we can, we can perceive everything that happens completely differently. And uh, yeah, biogeometry, if you haven't looked up the work of Dr. Ibrahim Karim and uh, Jerea, his daughter, um, and her sister Layla, who's also teaching courses with, with them, um, I really highly suggest that you do. Um, I'm a huge fan. So yeah, these original laws of Ma'at, you know, the intentions become, you know, they, they change and transform and it becomes a game of the priests. Um, and, uh, you know, I have not polluted myself. I have, I have, um, not transgress the law. Well, oh, there's an easy one. I have not been wrong. <laughs> you know, it's it's to me these are these are these are the laws of the Hanut. These are the priests that are creating laws for control. Um, but the original intention was literally what we've been talking about. To maintain um, balance. To maintain yes, harmonic resonance, balance with nature, universal currents. Um, and so, you know, even the temples, you know, we, we talked about them being constructed as living, breathing uh, entities to interact with. Um, and this is actually a picture of, of a Hebrew temple. And of course, the Hebrews emerged out of Egypt. The entire uh, Old Testament of the Bible occurs in Egypt for the most part. Um, and here's my birthing box again. Um, and actually, it was someone on Facebook, Jeremy Schaff, that um, pointed this out on one of my posts, and I thought it was fascinating. He said, did you know the Holy of Holies of the Hebrew Temple was a perfect cube and that it was completely black inside? Hmm. This speaks to the first day or the first time before time outside of time. The pillar of light manifests in the midst of the cherubim, which is Acher. So again, you know, is the Ark of the Covenant speaking to this moment of the first time out of the birthing box? Um, and this is how we're weaving this understanding of the birthing box, the Ark of the Covenant, and look what we have through every temper, temple is a, uh, I call it Stargate portal, if you will, magnetic equator. Um, it's the center that divides the dual opposing wave spin of the positive and negative charge. The center line through the front door, you know, a 
yep. with the pylon the, with the it, pylons on either side representing exactly. the left and right hemispheres of the brain. Yeah. Exactly. You'll often see a lotus and papyrus on either side representing mm. the masculine and the and the feminine spin. They're they're the sema tally, if you will. You know, it, it's it's laid out in that expression in that breath. Um, and the holy of holies, you know, as I've said before, the ceiling is always coming down and the floor is always rising till you get to that cube at the back, right? That chamber that contains what? You know, an altar? Well, that's what we see here today. But um, I believe it, it's an ancient expression of this heart of consciousness, um, this place where heaven meets earth. So again, we're using all the same terminology to describe this, and it's expressed within symbolism, mythology, and structure. That's a big wow. And even their rituals, the headset. So, you know, this, this, is, this is, why is this occurring? Why did they do this? Uh, you know, <laughs> maybe it was just the way their creative consciousness works, but I believe they were laying down a pattern for us to discern, for to to understand how we can navigate this very moment on Earth. And there's a picture of just that <laughs> when we were just talking about the center, um, and here we see them using a tool called the mare, right? Um, this plow that opens the flow, you know, the, the, for the opens the path for the water to flow. And in this case, it's the electromagnetic, you know, energy to flow through the temple. Um, and we see this replica of a temple. And uh, we often see two paths of underground uh, flowing water on either side to represent and two wells to represent this energetic of this, you know, dual opposing waveform. Um, of an ancient magnetic equator. And here we have these images again, and are they speaking again to the center of, you know, the heart and the protection that, you know, the cherubim being the protection of the heart of consciousness. Um, you know, that, that Holy of Holies was the final room the high priest would enter after he passed through the veil which separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place. Um, and I'm showing here in the upper left-hand corner, that's the veil. They had curtains, right? So he's going through the veil to that place that we can't, we can't possibly, you know, see or it'll kill us, right? Um, because it's so powerful and it's the heart. It's the Holy Grail. It's, it's that um, complete gnosis. Uh, we said mm. Petra was on this ancient current, this line of fertility, the ancient magnetic equator. And um, I found this, I found it interesting because there's cubes all over the place and they call them um, um, gin blocks. Um, and they represent the power of God on earth uh, or thought to represent the power of God on earth. Uh, 26 gin blocks have been found in and around Petra, many along the road, which forms the approach to al -Sikh. Their shape suggests they may also have been symbols of the god Dushara, who in early Nabataean times was commonly represented as a block of stone, right? <laughs> Earthing box. So yeah, fascinating. Um, half, the halfway between Petra Visitor Center and the entrance to the sea, look out for three enormous squat monuments known as chin blocks or god blocks. Standing guard beside the path, they take their name from the Arabic word for spirit, the source of the English word genie. Other than the fact that they were built by Nabataeans in the first century AD, little is known about why or wherefore. Fascinating, right? We'll end there. <laughs> <laughs> but there will be much, much more. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thanks, Patricia. Thanks, uh, Alan. Our website is horusrising.com. Please like, share, and subscribe, and we'll be back for more very soon.